Tidewater's had online programs for a long time, yeah. since the late 90s. Yeah. We offer a lot of online. About 25% of our FTE, 20 to 25% is online, and we've got roughly 45,000 credit students. In. It's about 50-50 uh, traditional and online. Mm. Uh, and to this point, you know, we, we've encouraged faculty you know, to, to teach it on their respective campus and to teach it you know, on a timeline, whether it's a 16-week course or an eight-week course, and the timeline that, that's comfortable with them. Now, as we get more sophisticated in our analysis, you know, we've noticed in, a, in one of the courses, for example, that we offered it in an eight-week format, uh, but the comparative courses outside of the Z model, we haven't offered in an eight-week format. And we've seen some nuance in the success of the students moving through an eight-week version of it in a Z uh, format versus the non-traditional. And so that becomes a factor then as we schedule out you know, future semesters and, and, and how we put them in the class schedule and, and base it on data and what, what, what the data is telling us about student success. I met David Wiley in August of 2012 in a panel discussion. And it was about OER. It was really my first exposure to OER. Uh, and so I listened to the panel, and at the end of the discussion, David just casually s made the statement that it was possible that an entire degree could be based solely on OER, but that no one had done it. And so that kind of stuck. I left that panel discussion, and I went to the next one, but I couldn't shake what he had said. So I, I sat through that next panel discussion after that one, but all I could think about was that statement. So as soon as that one was over, I went back and found David, and I asked him, was that true? Was there really enough OER content that someone could put together an entire degree and really no one had done it? And he confirmed, no, that, that was possible. Anything that you would find in the commons, anything that's freely licensed, you know, whether that's video, textbooks, PowerPoints, you name it, objects, anything that's in that domain that's licensed for use publicly will draw on that wherever it is. Now, most of it comes out of the commons and the common sources. So anything that's out there in that regard. And so I asked him if he would be willing to help us do it at Tidewater. And he said, absolutely. You know, so I, I kind of thought about it for the next week or two, went back, uh, started thinking about where we might start the conversation at Tidewater. Uh, I knew of, first of all, we have a lot of good faculty at Tidewater, but there was one faculty member in particular who I thought, this sounds like her. And so, I asked her, and uh, asked her two questions. Her response was immediate and, 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 and positive, and I knew with both of those responses that we were going to find a way to make this happen. First, I asked if she thought it could be done to create, and we weren't calling it a Z degree initially, we are calling it a, a textbook free degree, not knowing what else to call it. Uh, could we do this? I asked her, and she said, oh yeah, absolutely. And I asked her if she'd be willing to lead a team of faculty to, to create it. Absolutely. And so that was late 2012. In January 2013, we started the process. Mm -hmm. And by August of that year, so 12 months, within 12 months of hearing it was possible, we launched in pilot mode our business degree in Associate of Science and Business Administration um, we launched. Now, what had happened in that time frame is we identified a group of faculty after we selected 21 courses that would be a part of the business degree. We went through a process of identifying uh, which courses, half of the courses in our business degree are required program courses, the other half are electives. In the electives, we went and looked at what our business students were taking in that mix. After we identified that list of courses, we compared that to the OER that was available, matched that up. So now we had the 21 courses. Then we found the team of faculty. There were 13 of them initially. After we got to that point, we brought in uh, the trainers, which was Lumen Learning, and um, uh, began to learn a little bit about OER and the process we were going to use to structure our courses. And the way that process worked was each of those 21 courses were stripped right down to the learning outcomes. And then they were rebuilt, finding the OER content matched those outcomes. All right, so we had all the courses ready to go August of 2013, and we launched. Uh, and from that point on, we're in our 
We're in our second year of our pilot. We'll wrap it up at the end of the spring semester. We've learned a lot during this time. Uh, what we've been working on throughout, start to finish, uh, is building the capacity so that at the end of this, you know, having answered the question, yes, it can be done, the next question is, well, how far do we want to go with it? What comes next? And so we're putting in place the capacity to replicate what we have done with the Z degree. I feel so fortunate. Now, I was at the right place at the right time hearing David say that. I was at the right place at the right time finding a faculty member who would lead the effort. And we built a team around, around her, essentially. Uh, the faculty who are involved are innovative. They, they're willing to try something new. And, and because we made adjustments where they had concerns going through, we've really not had pushback. Uh, now, there have been challenges. But the challenges have been the kind of challenges that you would expect in launching an effort like this and that the learning curve was steep for all of us. None of us knew anything about OER. Uh, we had to draw on what we were doing outside of OER in terms of setting standards, which helped us. Um, and to give you an example of you know, where, we've, where we had to you know, make adjustments in order to, to make this work, uh, when we initially went through the training on the front end of this before we let off in August, we got into the conversation about which LMS we were going to use. And I very much, leading up to this conversation, wanted to be exploring with other LMS. Excellent question. And it also speaks to our conversations on scalability, which right. we're often asked about. And so, you know, going back to the beginning of this for us, we started what we have done with the intent of it being scalable. And a couple of things that means is first, the courses that we offer in the degree, in the Z degree, there are online courses, there are traditional courses, and there's hybrid courses. It also means, and what we've done is, it's not just full-time faculty. We have adjunct faculty that are teaching in it. And so in our mix of how we've created the Z degree, there's opportunity for any faculty member to participate and deliver it in any format they're comfortable with. Now, when you look at our policy, the standards are set very high in the policy. And one thing it says, for example, is, it doesn't matter how you're teaching it or who's teaching it. All of the content in a Z course is in our LMS. And for us, that's Blackboard. The reason for that is when you look at the components of our model, one of the components is this continuous improvement. And we say in policy that a faculty member who teaches a Z course for us, they must use and demonstrate use of the data, the, the quantitative data that we provide them at the end of the course to take a look that analyzes that course they must use that data to improve it. The, by having that content in our LMS, it gives us the ability to run those analytics to generate that report and hand it off to the faculty members. We started for a couple of reasons. One was uh, our business program is our second highest producer of graduates. And so it's offered in all of, you know, all of our locations, our four campuses. It's offered wherever we have you know, a location to offer the business program, which means we have lots of sections of those courses that are available. That was the first reason. Second reason was, as I began to think through who, who on the faculty side is going to be, I think, the best champion in, to drive this forward, you know, the person who came to mind was Professor Linda Williams, who's been our, our champion from, from day one on this. And so putting those two things together it was the logical place to start. So we're starting the analysis and lining up the rest of the degrees that we offer and assessing where, if we, if we begin to expand, where do we have courses in those next degrees that we want to bring online that need to be built out. And so once we have a good idea of what courses need to be built using the model that we use, the same process that we use with the, with the business degree, we'll have an idea of what comes next. So we're very much in the process of doing that analysis. So we um, we look at so let's let's say you know the next the most popular degree at Tidewater is, is our social science degree. So we look at that degree and all the courses that can be used to complete it. We look at first what courses have we already developed at Tidewater and match them up against the courses that are in the social science degree. Then we look at what courses the system in Virginia has created that are outside of our portfolio that are that, that are potential 
courses that we can adopt for Z. Then we look at in the OER world, and so let's assume for a moment that psych is a psychology 101 is, is a course that, that's one that we don't have in a Z mode, and it's not in the inventory. We need to build that out. We need to find the faculty member, put the incentive in place, and have that course created. It can be taught either way. It's, it's, it was designed online in our LMS. And so that will become an outward facing course for anybody to use. You know, so that's, that will be, that's a requirement in policy. The other key thing that we've done and have learned along the way is our librarians can and will play a huge role in our ability to sustain this. And so our librarians then are being trained to be trainers on our course. That gives us the capacity at the campus level then to deliver that course to any faculty member who wants to complete it. The librarians have taken that a step further. They've created library guides for anyone who wants to teach with OER or Z course at Tidewater. They will become the content curators and the point of contact as our internal experts for a faculty to reach out to and ask questions and, and get into that pipeline. Um, so, you know, we're, we're still identifying where those core components are in order for us to sustain beyond our pilot. We've laid much of that groundwork in place and I'm pretty confident that when we come out the end of this pilot, we can, we can take it anywhere we want to take it. Six components that have, have helped us achieve and get where we are uh, with a Z degree. And, and I spent some time talking about policy, institution level policy. We've not been able to find institution level policy out there in the open world you know, that we could draw on and begin to shape what we're doing. And so we really started from scratch. And in two year, year and a half's time, we've come up with a pretty solid policy and procedures that, that are designed to help our faculty to provide guidance and support for them. The Z team included uh, myself, an associate vice president who works for me, who's been an asset in this process all along, and I'll come back to that. Professor Williams as the lead faculty member, we built a 13-member faculty team who's done most of the work in, in getting us this far. Uh, my lead administrator uh, put together an advisory committee that's made up of all those pieces outside the classroom that need to make it work in the classroom. So your counselors, your advisors, the data collection, the deans who are impacted by what we've done with the Z option, they've helped guide this process from start to finish. In, in determining you know, what capacity we need to sustain this thing beyond pilot, we have since created uh, a course for our faculty to certify them to teach OER and online. And so it's a requirement now, if they want to teach a Z course, they have to complete it. If they want to just use OER, they don't have to, but they should. Our policy, it opens with a purpose statement. Our purpose statement has been clear since the day we launched. It's, it's aligned with our mission, and it says that we are, we are trying to achieve two outcomes with the Z degree. First one is we want, to, we want to provide students access so that they can be successful. And that means to the extent that we can eliminate textbook cost as a barrier, that, that's, that's the goal. The second one is we want our faculty to be as effective and efficient as they can be in using OER, which means they have the ability to mix, reuse, pull out what doesn't work, and end the practice of, and our faculty will say this, teaching chapter six in a book because it's between chapter five and seven, right? Now we're only using content that's aligned to the outcome in that course. So it's a leaner course and we can measure the effectiveness of that resource and the way that it's used and the, and the way that it's designed in the course and come out of it with some analytics that, that, that inform us in a quantitative way what we can do to improve that course. So we, we looked at Canvas, but our faculty said uh, it was too much for them to learn a new LMS and at the same time be learning about OER. So I wanted to push moving to a different LMS but backed away from that because it would have, it may have tipped over our project and we wouldn't have gotten off the ground. There have been key decisions along the way. 
uh, that that uh, I think has helped enable and encourage our faculty. There was a financial incentive. About 60% of the cost that has gotten us to this point has been development and paying faculty to, to build these courses out. I think that incentive helped. Um, you know, another key thing about what we've done in captured in policy, our faculty uh, were, were uncomfortable initially in designing these courses and making them outward facing for the world to see. And it was deliberate on my part to not make that the reason why we were doing this. But knowing that we were going to get to a point in a conversation if we were successful, where we needed to figure out how we were going to handle this. What our faculty said as we gained experience was they wanted to teach it at least twice and get comfortable with it before they shared it with the world. That's what we put in policy. What we say in our policy when we look at it is, each of our courses that are Z-degree courses must go through two continuous improvement cycles before we make it available to the world. Now, one of the questions we have gotten consistently, every time we present, and we got some yesterday, is when are our courses going to be available? And again, my job has been to be somewhat protective of our faculty. They need to be comfortable before we turn this into, you know, into, into chaos of sorts. And so you know, we've, we, we can now say that when you look at our policy, our faculty have said, let's teach it twice and then make it available. We come out the end of our two-year pilot in spring. And at that point, uh, our content will be outward facing. Some of it is now, but we'll be at a point where, uh, where we, can, we can share most of what we have done. Our accreditation is coming up in two years. Uh, I can't see any, anything in terms of you know, what we need to respond to with accredit in, in, a, in their accreditation standards that speaks to open content. But we get those kinds of questions. One of the questions that I got early on from a faculty member who's not in the Z degree is, well, what about our biggest transfer institution in the business degree? You know, they're not going to like it that we're not using books. My response to that has been, if, if they're deciding what students they're going to allow in based on a book we're using in a business program, we've got bigger issues than the textbook. So let's sit down and figure out what they are. That conversation has dried up. I don't see and haven't gotten any word of any showstoppers in terms of what we are doing that, that impact or will impact us in terms of accreditation or any other regulation. Another one that gets asked is our bookstore. What, you know, what's our bookstore? Are they concerned about this? And what are they saying about what we're doing with, with a degree that doesn't require students to buy textbooks? We are, so our bookstore partner at Tidewater is Barnes & Noble. We invited them in the conversation from, from the launch. Uh, and my thinking had been all along in encouraging them to join us. The, I, 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 my assumption is, is they may have a role to play in where we're headed in with, 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 with OER. I don't know what it is. Uh, that's for them to figure out. They're welcome to partner with us and learn as we go. Okay. They've, not, they've not been in the conversation uh, since that initial launch. Actually, we've noticed a lot, and we're going to continue to watch this thing very carefully. So we start with asking our students, what do you think about taking a course that's OER-based and not a textbook? Uh, the response to the, the student satisfaction questions, all of them have been in the range of 85% or higher that they like the Z courses, they are just as good if not better than the traditional textbook course, they would recommend it to their friends. And what we're seeing is when we launched, we, only, we launched with those 21 courses and it was one section of each one of them where the faculty were teaching on which campus. Students began to say to us, well, I want to take a Z course on the campus where I'm taking courses. Can you add one? And so now in pilot year two, we've expanded the group of faculty in the number of sections to begin to meet that demand. That's the satisfaction data. In the metrics that we pay attention to on student success, primarily drop, withdrawal, success, we've applied the same standard that we did with faculty in selecting content. What we were hoping to see was that students would do at least as good, if not better, in Z courses as they do in the, in the non-Z courses. And, and in fact, that is what we're seeing. With one caveat, we're not losing as many students 
in Z courses as we are the non-Z courses. So we're retaining more and getting them to the finish line in larger numbers. That's right, and so that has become for us, not only is that a key metric in terms of student success, but it's become a potential factor long-term sustainability in how we fund this. If we're retaining more students and not losing them, and that those tuition dollars stay with the college, that's a good thing, very good thing, and may help us fund it. Now, the last thing is, in terms of student savings, for the student, so we, so you, I'm assuming you've seen the numbers that you know, the typical student spends twelve hundred dollars a year on textbooks. You know, the number we use is conservative. It's a hundred dollars a textbook that comes out of Spark and some of the other agencies that have tried to put a number on a, a per textbook cost savings. We will wrap up our pilot, and based on what we know right now, we'll have somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty seven hundred students who've completed a Z section in a in two-year pilot mode for us. If each of them saves $100 a textbook, that's a little over a quarter of a million dollars those students have saved in taking a Z course. We're taking that one step further. We have looked at bookstore sales on textbooks, textbooks and textbook materials only, okay? At Tidewater, so we're talking one college, we looked at summer 2013, fall 2013 and spring 2014, one academic year. In one academic year at one college, we spent $11.9 million on textbooks alone. 60% of that number, a little over 7 million of it, was financial aid spent on those textbooks. Pell money, student loans. One college, one academic year, just under $12 million on textbook cost. So you think about that and play this scenario out. That's the kind of impact potentially we can have on eliminating the cost of textbooks you know, across the board. Now, I say that and I also say at the same time that what we are doing with you know, the, the, the Z degree and the no textbook option, right now you know, our perspective is, is it may be one more or one additional cost saving measure in how we're trying to reduce cost. And so we have we offer rental options and that number has climbed significantly over the last three years. We offer e-text options. They've not taken off, but they're out there as an option to, to reduce cost. Uh, used textbooks have been out there for a while. So in the list of options, we've added one now that's a no textbook cost savings option. Uh, and, and so that's, you know, not knowing where this is going to go long term, that, that's sort of how we see it in the taxonomy of you know, reducing, reducing costs. The answer to that question is back, is back in our data. You know, if we are retaining students and more of them are succeeding, absolutely. Uh, with our bookstore partnership, I don't know the numbers, but I'm assuming that as a college like other colleges that we, we generate some income from that. But I have to think that whatever the amount of that income is, it pales in comparison when you look at those financial aid dollars. You know, so the, the larger economic response to that I think is beyond us. Yeah. If we can say to taxpayers, we can save you $12 million in one college alone, and we've got the data to show that it can be done, you know, you tell us. Yeah, and we've not had conversations yet anyway, and I'd love to have this conversation. You know, instead of the students spending their financial aid dollars, whether it's loan money or their own money, on textbooks, uh, would it be smarter to, for them to be able to use that money to buy the devices to access the content rather than buying the books? And that content is out there for them to see all the time. The primary reason why I mentioned scale is it goes back to that initial comment from David that a degree could be put together this way. I, I remain somewhat baffled to this day why other colleges have taken it to scale. And, and I didn't mention this data point, but for the student who finishes the entire degree, the entire degree, the Z degree, that student will save about a third of their entire cost of the degree with us. You know, $2,500 or more in textbook savings. Uh, I don't know why any college wouldn't be putting 
entire programs on that path rather than a pocket here and a pocket there. I think we need to move beyond that. If we're really going to have an impact, it needs to be taken to a larger scale. And the degree, I think, is the next logical place to take it. We see the success at the course level in those pockets of areas, but that's not enough. Put the entire degree on that scale. We have at Tidewater you know, roughly 3,000 students any given time in our business program, and 10 to 12 percent of them are graduating each year. If each one of them saves $2,500, that's, that's significant. Couldn't logically understand how it was possible to produce a degree in this format, eliminate the cost, and no one had done it. Well, why? Why? Why hasn't anyone done this? A lot of unanswered questions there. And you know, going back to our launch, you know, my job has been as this as the chief academic officer to, to create the conditions for our faculty to experiment with us. And if the experiment didn't work, okay, we we tried it, we took the risk, it's over. If it did work, then what 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 did it take to make it work? In the early conversations, one of the statements that I made right up front to the faculty so that I, I could put them at ease in, in opening the door for them to experiment, uh, they, weren't, they, they were responsible as the subject matter experts to select the OER. The OER that they selected had to be at least as good as or better than the traditional textbooks that they were using to teach their courses. They were in the driver's seat and remain in the driver's seat, and we reinforce that in policy. So that eliminated you know, any concern about whether or not they had to use it and who was making that decision. You know, so, so, so my job has been to make sure as we advance this that they're comfortable and we're in agreement as a college and as a faculty and how that works. That, that, comes, from, that comes from the top, and it comes from the bottom up. So for us, it's very much been you know, sort of a top-down and a grassroots bottom-up effort. It's not been strictly top-down, and I think that's why partly we've not seen more degrees and programs like what we've done. Uh, they've been essentially bottom-up, uh, and so you see pockets of areas and not entire programs.